Okay, so it is time for the last of today's lectures, uh, which is at the same time the first which will be given online uh, via Zoom. So uh, our speaker is Alexandru Hirvasitu from Sunny Buffalo in USA. And uh, before he starts his talk, I would like to say a few words about him. So uh, he obtained uh, his PhD in 2014, and uh, his thesis was uh, devoted to the investigation of linearly reducti reductive quantum groups. And his research interests are very diverse, including, among others, non-commutative geometry, quantum groups, representation theory, operator algebras, category theory, quantum graphs, and so on. The list continues. He is an author of 65 publications, and those publications are already published. And he is also author of more than 30 preprints. So please recall, he obtained his PhD in 2014. So, and having uh, almost 100 publications, which I find completely amazing. Yeah, there and, was a pandemic. <laughs> And uh, he's also a winner of many uh, grants and awards, uh, in particular uh, applications of uh, graphs and higher rank graphs, algebras in non-commutative geometry, the grant, non-commutative spaces, their symmetries and geometric quantum group theory, and also quantum groups, quantum symmetries and non-commutative geometry. So a lot of non-commutativity, a lot of quantumness, but his talk uh, will be devoted to distance, curvature, and symmetry, and we will see how much quantum his talk will be. So, Alexandro, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much for that and for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, it's true that I was told there's plenty of non-commutativity in your workshop anyway, so maybe we won't emphasize that too much. Um, the talk is pretty much a mixed bag. It's roughly on and around distances. So I'm going to write that down on and around distances. Ways of measuring how far apart things are from each other. And the uh, Specifically, what we're going to do with those types of structures is talk about their symmetries, but maybe not so much quantum symmetries, which is what non commutative geometry people would jump at. But just plain symmetries are interesting enough. So, um, certainly, it'll be uh, plenty to, uh, to occupy us for one hour, which is not very long. Um, so, I am going to start with what I'm gonna assume for most of you is gonna be just very basic recollections and maybe go on in that vein for quite a bit. So since this is the end of your day anyway, maybe you can just take it as an opportunity to sort you of- You would be surprised, Alexander, but we have a talk half past 7 p.m. our time about compact quantum groups. But ah. it's a student talk. <laughs> okay, I see, I see. <laughs> All right. So not quite the end, but not quite. almost, almost getting there. Um, okay, so we'll start with some uh, very basic recollections. So th the idea here is, sorry about that, I clicked something, it's what happened with tablets. Um, the idea is that we want to measure how far apart a thing is from another thing. And they live inside some ambient space, I'm going to call it from now on. This is like our universe that everything lives in. And the thing is over here. Things are called points. This one is called X, and this one is called Y. Let me also draw X as a little dot and label it X. And this is a little dot, and I'm labeling it Y. And I want to make sense of how far apart they are. And you must have seen how people do this. They decree that there's something called the distance between the two, V of X, Y. And they call it the distance. We call this the distance function that takes two points and spits out a number. 
And then we just impose some conditions, namely the axioms that we think distances should satisfy. Uh, taking examples from real life experience as our guides. And I'm gonna re remind you what those axioms are. So a distance function on a set X, a distance function I might drop. So function is gonna be parenthetic. I'm sorry about the handwriting. X is just a set, but as soon as we start equipping it with things like distances, I'm gonna start calling it a space. But space is a fancy word for set, really. It's just uh, to, uh, to hint that there's some additional structure. Is a function, And it looks like this. It goes from X cross X because it takes two arguments, right? To the non-negative reals. And I'm gonna call it B. And it must satisfy a bunch of axioms that we think of as natural if we're gonna call this thing a distance. First, it should vanish exactly when the two things coincide. So the distance between two points is zero only when the two points are at the same point. So d of x, y is zero if and only if x is equal to y. So this tells you two things because it's two implications. When the two are equal, the distance is zero and it's only zero in that case. Um, then it should be symmetric. Also fairly reasonable is going from here to there should be the same as going from there to here. Yeah, at least in, in terms of how, how long it's going to take me or uh, how strenuous the lock is going to be and so on. This is for every X and Y. And also what you know as the triangle inequality, going from A to C should not take more than first going from A to B and, and then from B to C the distance from x to z is at most the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z for every x, y, and z in my space. These all live in the ambient space x. So that's what we mean by a distance and a space equipped with a distance is what we call a metric space. And pretty much the whole talk is about metric spaces in one guise or another, maybe just naked metric spaces with no other structure as just introduced or metric fancier metric spaces as uh, we will discuss momentarily. So this, this whole package is what we call a metric space. And distances are also sometimes called metrics to make the terminology more coherent, metric space. And you see already, and this is all very basic because it's, you encounter it very quickly in real analysis courses and so on, um, undergraduate courses. But already when you start discussing things as basic as this, there are some maybe surprising asides to make, and I want to make one now to be revisited later. You see the distance, if I'm going to call it a distance on first sight, it seems reasonable I should ask it to be a number. How far is this place from this other place? But it turns out it's very natural for various reasons, some of which will come up during the talk, to sometimes allow distances to take infinite values. So maybe I'm gonna give myself an out here and say, maybe, maybe also infinity. So it's a non-negative real and also possibly infinite. And everything I said here, these three dashes, they make sense. The first two make sense, of course. And then the third one also makes sense because I have an ordering on the real line on this thing. On the real line, the non-negative real line, united with infinity, I have an ordering that's just what you think. The, the real numbers are ordered as usual and infinity is bigger than everything. 
So it makes sense to talk about less than or equal to. It also makes sense to talk about plus. Infinity plus any non-negative real is infinity, right? So the structures that go into the third dash line make sense on this bigger set. You wrote your inequality in the opposite direction, yes? Are greater than or equal to zero in this disjoint uh, union, yes? In this disjoint union. That's zero. right. Yes. Uh -huh. That's right. But I'm already in bigger than or equal to zero here. And infinity is already. Yes, bigger. but I mean the, the direction of the inequality, yes? Which inequality? Uh, R with subscript. And it should be oh oh the direction yes this one yeah yeah let uh, me erase opposite that. inequality uh -huh. that, that is a typo <laughs> apparently you can make typos like in real life as well <laughs> yeah yes yeah yeah that was wrong that was nonsense yeah, sorry about that yes so this is what I meant thank you for that um but it, it's okay higher up yes yeah okay so yeah so metric spaces and then some sometimes in some sources metric space Unadorned, so, sometimes people call this a generalized metric space, but on occasion in some sources, like there's a, uh, a book by Burago, Burago and someone else, even of, I think, BBI, I know the, the, the initials, but not the names. Uh, by metric space from the get-go, they mean the distances can be infinite. So it's so useful that it might be profitable to build into the definition, the possibility of infinite distances. So, right, so this is what we mean by metric spaces. Uh, before I leave this definition, maybe it, it's worth noting, I think earlier today, we had a talk about category theory. I think Tomas gave it, yeah? If I, if I remember right. your uh, yes. schedule correct. correctly. Uh, it might be worth mentioning what, a reasonable notion of a category of metric spaces should be. So these are the objects, the objects or category of metric spaces. The objects are, maybe you can guess, the objects are metric spaces, right? The objects are metric spaces. And then for the morphisms, it's not always possible, not always uh, obvious is the word I was looking for. It's not always obvious what you should choose for morphisms. For instance, one naive thing we tend to do in topology courses where metric spaces are introduced only sort of secondarily as a source of topologies. What we do there to begin with is we define a category consisting of metric spaces and continuous functions. You can define a topology from a metric and continuity and so on. But continuity forgets too much about the metric. What's more sensible to do so as to remember some of the metric is to encode the metric into the morphisms. So the morphisms, People seem to agree, people who like to work with categories of metric spaces, they seem to agree that the most reasonable thing to do is to take for your morphisms the short maps or the contractions. Short. I'm going to define short in just a second. It's not the, the colloquial term short. It means something more. Short maps. Sorry, could you maybe comment on the following um, notion of morphism? Not uh, continuous map, but uniformly continuous map. Uh, well, those would be appropriate for uniform spaces. There's something in between metric spaces and topological spaces, right? There's yeah. topological yeah. spaces, uniform spaces, metric spaces. Uniformly continuous maps are the right notion of morphism in the category of uniform spaces. Okay. Still not metric, still weaker. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so a map F, I'm going to call short if it does not increase distances. So it contracts distances, but weakly contracts. The, the inequalities are uh, the inequalities are not strict. So the distance from Fx to Fx prime, I'm going to do now instead of y, because I don't want to confuse you. Y looks like it should live in y. I want points that live in x. So I'm going to call them x and x prime. 
The distance between the images of X and X prime is at most the distance between X and X prime. I have two distances. This is the distance in Y and this is the distance in X. And this should happen for every X and X prime in X. Yeah, so they are the functions that do not increase distances or contract them weakly. We can also call them contractions or weak contractions. So one Lipschitz, sometimes people call them one Lipschitz. If I do a C here, that's C Lipschitz. If I allow some scaling, that's what one stands for in one Lipschitz. Yeah, so that's the right, so to speak. Uh, category of metric spaces, right in all sorts of ways, right? It's well behaved in category theoretic terms. It has nice limits, co-limits and so on. It's locally presentable if you know what that means. This is for category theoretically minded people. If you don't know what that means, forget about it because it's not gonna come up again during the talk. We're just on a side. Um, right, so, that's what we do to make sense of distances at their most basic. Just tell me how far a thing is from another thing. Did anybody want to ask anything here? Because I want to switch to a different definition. So it's a natural spot to stop. All right, then we will forge on. So, Distances I said at their most basic because the definition gives you just that and nothing more. It allows you to make sense of how far apart two points are. Now, the fancier thing to do is to tell me about infinitesimal distances. How far you moved in an infinitely small interval of time. That means making sense not of distances per se, because in, to make sense of, the, of the infinitesimals, we have to uh, uh, to take two uh, two larger detour. But you you want to make sense of velocities. So how to make sense? To make sense? To make sense? Not just of distances, but of velocities. We define a richer structure. Um, first, before I, I say what it is and give the definition in somewhat rough terms, um, why do I refer to velocities as more than distances? Because if you take, let me just write some, as of yet, a bit of nonsense. So let's say you have your space X, and you're moving through it. Moving through it means some curve from the unit interval. Think of the unit interval as measuring time. So a, a variable that spans zero one is a variable of time. And gamma is a curve. Gamma is a curve in X, which is to say a continuous function. I haven't defined continuity. You just take it for granted that there's a way to do that so as to a, uh, single out a particularly nice class of functions from zero one to X. And we call those curves if they're continuous. And you think of them as tracing out movement in this metric space. Now, if you could make sense of a velocity, if we have velocities, which we will later on. Now I just want to uh, hint at why we want them. If we had velocities and borrowing the notation from uh, maybe the 18th century, 17th, 18th century analysts, early ones, Newton, Leibniz, those guys, um, borrowing their notation of denoting velocities by dots on top of gamma. So gamma is the curve and gamma prime, not prime, gamma dot is its velocity, which we haven't made sense of, but think of it as some way of measuring how far you've moved in an infinitesimally small interval of time. 
as opposed to this one, which is a definite interval of time. Then we could define distances, could define the distance traveled I don't know if you want me to spell travel with a double L, if you like British English, I'm gonna leave it with a single L. The distance traveled uh, along the path gamma as the integral over the time interval of the length of the velocity dt. Now this length thing is something we'll talk about in a minute. So this is the length and gamma prime, sorry, erase this. Gamma prime is a velocity, which is a vector. Velocity, so a vector. So the length of the vector makes sense as a number. And this becomes a real valued function on the on the interval zero one and it makes sense to talk about integrating it and so on. So the point is, I mean, even you know, ill-defined as these notions are as yet, the point is that if you have velocities, you can make sense of distances. So velocities are the finer notion, they're the richer structure. If you have one, you get the other downstream, so to speak. That's why I was referring to the velocity inducing structure as the richer one. So in any yeah, event- You need both you, of them, yes? You need velocity and also you need this length function, yes? That's right, yeah. But we'll have that as the package that, that I'm about to, that I'm turning to now. Okay. Um, yeah, so so uh, to make sense of all of this, as uh, Tomas said, both, both of these sorts of things, vectors and their lengths, uh, we, package that as what is called the Romanian manifold. Today, in honor of Bernard Riemann, who first defined the rudiments of these things, uh, Romanian, Romanian manifolds. And I will give a rough sketch of what the definition entails because it's going to take a while and it's already 11.22. Yeah, so we don't have to uh, package it uh, judiciously. So uh, first of all, this manifold thing already allows you to talk about vectors. So vectors, uh, as Tomas rightly pointed out, these are two different things and you can make sense of them separately. Manifolds already allow you to make sense of velocities. Man by manifold, I, I mean what's usually referred to as a smooth, smooth, or sometimes C infinity, or infinitely differentiable, differentiable manifold. And it means the following, again, roughly. It means one of these X's, one of these things we've decided we're gonna call spaces, space X with patches or functions by U from U to open subsets in some Euclidean space Rn. And these I'm gonna to require to be bijections. And the U are various subsets of X. U are various subsets of X. Certain distinguished collection, they're supposed to satisfy some conditions I'm not going to list. And the point, what makes these infinitely differentiable, the point here is that as soon as two of these functions have overlapping domains, transitioning from one to the other 
can be done by infinitely differentiable functions on Rn. On Rn, we know what it means to be infinitely differentiable. If I model X locally as Rn, I can transport this differentiability over to X. So on U intersect U prime, I have U intersect U prime, it sits inside U, and also sits inside u prime. I have a function phi u going to some rn. I have a function phi u prime going to some r. I'm going to make my life easy and take it to be the same n. And now I can go from phi u of the intersection. I can pull back because phi u was a bijection, remember? The u intersect u prime, and I can push forward with phi u prime to phi u prime of the intersection. This guy, this composition, is meant to be an infinitely differentiable function with infinitely differentiable inverse. So it's a bijection, infinitely differentiable. And then the inverse is automatically, well, they will end, end with infinitely differentiable inverse. Yeah, so it's a bunch of patches. A manifold is a bunch of patches that look like Rn so that the transition between different patches on their overlaps can be made infinitely differentiable differentiably. This is what being C infinity is meant to, uh, to capture. And as soon as you have such a thing, you can make sense of velocities. Because if I give you a function gamma into x, we always assume these u's cover x so by cutting up the interval, if I have to, I can assume gamma lands in one of these u's, and then it gets sent by phi u into Rn, and now I can talk about velocities of gamma. So now I can make sense of make sense sense of the velocity. of gamma as usual. Meaning you compose it with phi u, and this takes you from zero one to Rn, and just take derivatives. Take, so this is, a, this is an n component function and take derivative component wise derivatives that gives you vectors. Yeah, so this is what we mean by vectors and it, you can make sense of this through these transition functions intrinsically. It doesn't matter which u you chose and which phi u you chose. You can switch from one perspective afforded by phi u to the other perspective afforded by phi u prime coherently so as to preserve your notion of velocity. So in this fashion, you can talk about velocities. You can talk about talk of velocities or curves in um, or curves in X and the curves remember look like this and now if I give you a point if I give you a point, Let's call it, let's call it X for consistency, right? If I give you a point X in X, then all possible velocities gamma dot of zero for curves from zero one to X that send gamma, that send, sorry, that send zero to little x 
all such, so you range over all gammas. Gamma is the thing that ranges. So for a picture, X looks like this. This is the point, and this is one gamma, say gamma one. This is another gamma, gamma two. This is a third gamma, gamma three, and so on. For all of them, you can make sense of, of the velocity. This is gamma one dot of zero. This is gamma two dot of zero. This is gamma three dot of zero, et cetera. All of these vectors, we're calling them now, form a vector space, what we know as a vector space in linear algebra. All possible velocities, velocities, so I'm in the middle of a sentence, form a vector space. So sorry, the formal definition is that uh, you are taking this equivalence classes of these curves. That's with right. Value x in zero, and the corresponding equivalence relation is that two curves are equivalent if this, uh, after composing with this uh, this coordinate charts, uh, you get the same result. Yes. That's and, well. And I I for don't every and it's uh, equivalent to, to choosing uh, one particular. No. Not necessarily. You can do this about a million ways. I don't have to impose equivalence at the level of curves necessarily. I can let curves move as they please. I can then later impose equivalence at the level of vectors. I want to identify the velocity vectors so that they make sense as elements of a single vector space. I can impose equivalence there for the tangent vectors, not for the curves necessarily. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah. And then different curves might give me the same tangent vector. That's perfectly fine. That, that's not a problem. So the curves don't need to be distinguished themselves. It's the vectors that where you have to be careful. Um, anyway, the, the all of the once I've done that, once I've done was Tomash was asking me how I was gonna do it. <laughs> Adam, that Adam done, not Tomas. Oh Adam, sorry, yeah. Well, yeah. the voices are a little hard to distinguish. Um uh, once I've done that, I can take this vector space in hand and call it something. It's called the tangent space to the manifold x at little x. And this is provided to me by the smooth structure. As soon as I have a smooth manifold structure, I have these things. T, uh, Tx, my screen was getting a little... Uh, a little dark there. I think we're good. Okay, so I have these tangent spaces, one at every point, one at every point of the manifold. And now to make this thing into a Romanian manifold, I need some extra bit of structure that tells me how long vectors in here are. As was pointed out way early in that good observation that these are two structures, we have tangent vectors. Now I want to talk about their lengths. We don't have lengths of tangent vectors yet. So a Romanian manifold, manifold is a smooth manifold. With a choice, choice of inner product. on every tangent space to x, x, where the little x is range over big x. And of course, you, you want these things to be compatible. So for, first of all, what's an inner product? And maybe you remember from linear algebra. So an inner product is something like this. We're not complex, right? So everything is real. So, uh, is something that returns a number for every pair of vectors. So these are vectors. And this is supposed to be bilinear, meaning if I keep every, every variable, if I keep every any of the variables fixed, it's linear in the other variable. And also 
the norm of v squared, which is by definition, the inner product of v with itself is bigger than or equal to zero with equality if and only if v is zero. That's what an inner product is on a real vector space. And we have to, we want to choose these inner products nicely so as to conform to the C infinity structure. So you want them to vary smoothly, but I'm not going to get into that. So a, a smoothly varying choice of inner product. Yeah, question? Yeah, it should be also symmetric. I don't know whether you mentioned it or. It, it should be symmetric. It should be symmetric as well. Yes. Uh, so V W equals W V. Somehow symmetry is so easy to. Uh, to lose track of. I almost forgot about it for metrics as well. <laughs> so it should be symmetric too. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So now we can make sense of lengths, right? This is what we mean by the length. This is the length square. Remember, you take a square root of that, which makes sense if you're non negative. So that's what we meant by the double bars upstairs. Where is it? Upstairs here. So now this is fine as well. So if I give you such a gadget, a Romanian manifold, you can make sense of distances. How? How do you make sense of distances? A Romanian manifold. So it's first of all, a Romanian manifold. Romanian. So let, let me start over. Usually, usual notation notation for a Romanian structure, meaning one of these smoothly coherent uh, inner products is, uh, is G, Romanian structure. It's G. So G of you use it like this, G of V, V is what I was before calling V, V. Yeah. For tangent vectors, or you know, V belongs to some tangent space. Okay, so now if I give you a Romanian manifold, I said all of that because I'm gonna depict Romanian manifolds like this, M comma G. M is the space. Now I've switched to M for manifold. Um, as soon as I give you a Romanian manifold, you can make sense of distances between points. So X and X prime belong to M. Consider a curve gamma from zero one to M, gamma of, e of zero equals X and gamma of one equals X prime. Then the length of gamma is by definition, the integral from zero to one of the length, it's the same formula we had before, gamma dot, DT. But now everything makes sense because we know what gamma dot means. We define tangent vectors as gamma dots, if you recall. And we know what the length means. So now it's the same formula, except now it makes sense. And finally, the distance from X to X prime is by definition the infimum of the lengths of gamma for all such gamma. And now it should be clear after a moment's thought why I have to allow the possibility of infinite distances. It's because there might, for instance, there might not be any such gammas. Such gammas means curves that take the value zero, that take the value x at zero and one at and x prime at one. But maybe my Manifold is disconnected. It's two pieces, one over here, one over there. 
there's no way for a continuous curve. We're assuming continuity for curves that move conti continuously. Maybe it's not possible to get continuously from one point to another. So then you would take, so then the set of gammas is empty. And when I take the enthemum here, I take the enthemum over an empty set of reals. That's infinite. The enthemum of the empty set is infinite. Yeah. So it's very natural when you define distances by means of curves to allow infinite distances because there might not be enough curves in your space. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, let us consider the following example. I take a manifold M, Riemannian, and consider the disjoint union two copies of M. And then I would like to uh, look uh, on this uh, dual uh, formula for distance using Dirac operator. This formula, which is well known in non commutative geometry. So I can construct a Dirac uh, for this disjoint union. And what happens then? This uh, distance computed with this new Dirac operator on this disjoint union also would give me that the first copy. I, I, is I, I think, I think, I think so. I think the whole point of Khan's introduction of non commutative manifolds via Dirac operators, the whole point is that if you do that for classical manifolds, you get back this geodesic distance, the distance I just defined. So, yeah, I think you get infinity. I think you get the usual distance. The usual distance being this one I just defined. Whatever non commutative geometers do with the rock operators gets you back the geodesic distance for even, even for non connected things. Yes? I think so. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Well, again, if you just look at the definition, there must be some set. And it just must be empty. Right. And that one is going, probably going to be empty. Yeah. yeah. So it should be for similarly trivial reasons. So also, you can think of it heuristically. What, what could it be? If it's a number, which number? Which number? It's got to be a canonical number. There are no canonical numbers, <laughs> except maybe zero, but you're, you're not going to get that. So. <laughs> The only sensible thing you could possibly get is infinity. Other questions? Yeah, so that reminded me though, that discussion, this is sometimes called the geodesic distance. Geodesics are smallest length curves that connect points. If you have them, sometimes Romanian manifolds don't have a geodesic connecting two points, sometimes they do. So, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. So, is it right to think that uh, if I have a space with, uh, which uh, somehow resembles two copies of M, but there is a slight non commutativity in this connection between these two pieces, then it allows me to, to speak about finite distance between these two copies? Yes? Is it right? It depends what you mean by slightly. It's too vague a question for me. Uh, yes, so I mean uh, on the level of algebras, taking a tensor product with some uh, non-commutative algebra, which is finite dimensional, like almost commutative geometries. So um, heuristically, I can- I, I, my, in like, my intuition, which is all I can give you, is that in that case, you might get finite distances mm -hmm. because this this does tend to happen when you go non-commutative, when you pass from finite discrete spaces mm -hmm. to non-commutative versions thereof, you get properties that start to resemble connectedness. But short of actually working that out, I don't know. And I, I haven't worked out such examples. Mm -hmm. So I don't know is the honest answer. I would expect you might Depending on how you build in the non commutativity, obviously, there, it's going to depend on that. You might get finite distances. Yes, so one particular example of this phenomenon, I think, this is this uh, example of this uh, finite spectral triple uh, related to the standard model of uh, particle physics. That's one. Another is uh, in quantum groups. Non-commutative permutation groups start to behave as if they were connected. 
even though there's still permutation groups, they act on finite spaces, but nevertheless, somehow the quantum brings in enough extra stuff to connect the pieces. But in any event, uh, that's the yes. entanglement between disconnected pieces. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, there, there are numerous facets to that phenomenon. Yes. Other comments, questions? Is it obvious that uh, d of x x prime is equal to zero if and only if x equals to x prime? Not immediately, no, no. This is something people have to prove in, in these. Uh, typically, you'd find it in, uh, in sources on Romanian geometry, things like the Carmo and places like that. Um, that the fact that this global metric genuinely, honestly is a metric in particular, in the sense that it's non-degenerate, that it doesn't collapse for distinct points. This is something you have to prove. So no, it, it's not obvious. I think the, that the argument goes like uh, that you need some uh, bound from below of the quadratic form working locally. Something That's like right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at small balls around the point that miss the other point and live entirely within a coordinate patch, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not terribly difficult. And conceptually, it's not hard to see what you would have to do. But certainly, there's something to write down there. It's not snap your fingers. Those are good questions. <laughs> Other ones? And also, there is a slight uh, technical detail whether you consider all uh, smooth curves or, or uh, piecewise smooth. So, but one can indeed uh, consider only smooth curves. You can, if I, since I'm taking the enthemum, I can approach piecewise smooth as, mm -hmm. as closely as I want. Yes, yes, but the most natural way to get uh, triangle inequality is to admit piecewise smooth. That's if right. Join to to curves, uh, then you get something which is yeah. in general only piecewise. Smooth. You force yourself to be smooth, then you have to work harder there. That's correct. But that wouldn't be the the single detail I left out, right? Um, okay, right. So in this sense, in the sense that you can get a metric out of the Romanian structure, Romanian manifolds are the finer, uh, the finer um, concept. Now, to, uh, to get us talking about symmetries a little bit, at least, right, since we I only have 12 minutes, um, I, I will mention some results. It will be a little rushed, but that should be fine. Uh, to get us talking about symmetries, what should those mean? Well, what they usually mean? They mean, um, actually, if I may again appeal to the to category theoretic language, symmetries are isomorphisms in the appropriate categories. So symmetries of symmetries that's not what they are when you use the phrase in quantum symmetry, right? But we're not talking about quantum ones now. Symmetries are isomorphisms in the appropriate categories. So, We've talked about two sorts of structures, and I'm going to stick to that for the duration, which isn't long now. Uh, for metric spaces, you remember what the morphisms were. They were short maps, maps that contract distances. Well, if I'm an isomorphism, I need to have an inverse that's also a morphism in the category. So I need F to be a bijection and F, so F is bijective and F prime, sorry, not F prime, F inverse, have to both be short. Well, if F contracts distances and F inverse, 
also contracts distances, then they must both preserve distances. Because if one strictly contracts a distance, then the inverse must increase it, breaking contraction, right? So this implies that F is distance preserving or an isonomy. F, remember, looked like this. And it's an isometry in the sense that the distance or in the codomain is equal, equal now, not an inequality to the distance in the domain. Now, obviously, this is what you mean by structure preserving for metric spaces, distance preserving. If I allowed all continuous functions in my category, then isomorphisms would not be isometries, right? Because the inverse would not be forced to preserve distances. The same goes for uniformly continuous functions. Isomorphisms in the uniform category are not isometries. So this is what tells you that the right notion of morphism is the contraction. So that's what it is for metric spaces. For manifolds, for Romanian manifolds, what do we want? We want to preserve all of the structure. So. I want, and now I'm switching to M and GM. And on the other side, I suppose N and GN. Preserve all of the structure. This means that F should be infinitely differentiable or smooth. And it should preserve. So see, as soon as it's smooth, it's, it makes sense to define it at the level of tangent vectors. Because you can differentiate F. A smooth function has a differential. So F induces a map between tangent spaces and I want it to preserve lengths. Preserve length, preserves lengths. of tangent vectors, by which I mean the following. I mean that if I take the differential that I'm gonna write as DF, differential, and I apply it to a tangent vector, and then I take the length, that should be the same as the length of the vector for every vector in every tangent space Tx of m, where now remember df of v is going to be a tangent vector on the other side. It's in df of x of m. So these are tangent vectors in two different, on two or two different Romanian manifolds and then measuring their lengths on the two different sides. So this is quite the mouthful. You wanna preserve a lot of structure, but, but it turns out non-trivially that it's also enough to require that F be an isometry in the metric sense for the geodesic distance I described before. F is an isometry for the geodesic metrics. Sorry, please correct me if I'm wrong that the main part of this uh, opposite uh, direction of implication is proving that, uh, in fact, uh, from being isometry in the metric sense follows uh, uh, smoothness. That's the main right? part. That's right. Yeah, smoothness is automatic. And that's the that's the hard part. That's right. 
or hard, hard-ish. And that's the hardest, the hardest of the, of the various things you have to do. That's right. So you can dispense with all of this. It's all automatic if you preserve that global distance I defined. Global as opposed to infinitesimal. So uh, in some sense, the global geodesic distance on a Romanian manifold already knows everything about the Romanian structure, including the smoothness. Knows in the sense that it can be, th that if you have two Romanian manifolds that are the same, metrically speaking, they are the same Romanian speaking as well. So this is a non-trivial result. As, as was mentioned, the, the main part is showing that uh, if you're an isometry, just in the sense of preserving distances, then you are in fact smooth. You're a smooth map. Smoothness follows. So nice are Romanian manifolds that their smoothness follows from just this global distance structure that you impose on them. Um, okay, so to get to some of the more interesting stuff I was gonna mention having done this, this was mostly just defining things. Just put it easy. I only have four minutes. <laughs> um, I would like to say a little bit about how large you should expect symmetry groups to be. Now that we've decided what a symmetry is, I can take an object, I can take a single object, metric space, say, and consider its own symmetry. So symmetries from it to itself, right? They're automorphisms in the category. So um, its symmetries, symmetries form a group. Now you can collect all compact metric spaces I'm not going to remind you what compact means. It's a kind of smallness condition on a topological space. Into a single metric space. Into one big metric space. I'm going to call it MGH with a big D. GH is for Gromov Hausdorff. So MGH consists as a set of the isometry classes, classes of compact metric spaces. And D is the Gromov Hausdorff distance. This is a distance you define between two different metric spaces, which is zero exactly when the two metric spaces are isometric. So it's a measure of how not, how dissimilar they are in the category of metric spaces. So you collect all of them together into one gigantic metric space. You'll have a talk later in the week about moduli spaces. This is a bit, MGH is a bit like the moduli space of all metric spaces. And the collection, to state a theorem in my last minute, that's not, I wouldn't say it's due to me necessarily, but I also haven't seen it stated. The collection of XD in MGH 
with trivial symmetry group is very large. Very large can be made more precise. In some sense, most metric spaces have trivial symmetry group. Oh, sorry, you mean something like dense G delta set or? Uh, I mean, it contains a dense G delta. So it's oh, it's okay. a second bear category. Okay, thank you. Actually, it might even be a, a G delta. I'm not sure, but it definitely contains one. And that's what, that's what people usually mean by very large topologically speaking. And I think I'm going to stop now because I'm a minute over time. And I, I will just tell you as the last sentence that there's an analog beauty Eben for Romanian manifolds as well. Analog for Romanian. So the punchline was most things are asymmetric. And I guess I'm gonna end, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the engaging oh, so session. Do we have any questions? Maybe we'll start with uh, our uh, on site participants. So, if you have any question, please raise your hand and then wait for a microphone. So, uh, Alex, how about pseudo Riemannian manifolds? Would you care to comment about them and uh, contrast them with Romanian manifolds? How do you measure distances over there? What's the difference? And uh, for instance, is the same analog for pseudo Romanian manifolds true or not? I actually don't know if it's true. Um, I don't know if it's been looked at. Well, so pseudo Romanian, you mean Lorentzian, yes? Something like uh, Lorentzian. Yeah, yeah, indefinite yeah, metric. But not, not necessarily Lorentzian. Lorentzian is a, it, it, it refers to a specific indefinite metric of type plus, minus, 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 or something like that. Uh, Pseudo-Romanian means indefinite in general, right? Is exactly. what, I, what I understand you to mean. Yeah. Um, you can define lengths as people do in, uh, in general uh, relativity, where we do work with Lorentz uh, manifolds. So certainly you can define lengths. They can be imaginary, that's presumably acceptable, but I don't know about these sorts of rigidity results is the point. I don't know about that. Um, and also those examples are usually non-compact, yes? That's right. And, and I don't know to what extent, this, it's, this is what troubles me. I don't know to what extent these sorts of rigidity results depend on the structure group of the tangent bundle being compact. For Romanian manifolds, the structure group is the orthogonal group. And for Lorentz manifolds, it's not compact anymore. It's SO13 or whatever. So I don't know how important compactness is there. It might be. In any event, I don't know the answer to your question. It's, it's a good one. Thank you. Well, so someone should dig this up. I don't know if it's been looked at. Eben's work is from the 80s and it's specifically on Romanian manifolds, not pseudo Romanian. Can we give it as homework? <laughs> sure, yeah. It, it would make for a good research project, at least to find out what's known. Because some of this stuff is sometimes buried a little deep in the literature. Okay, anybody? Do we have some further question? Okay, maybe I would like to ask uh, about the following uh, notion. So you explained uh, this uh, distance in the context of Riemannian manifolds. And if you have Riemannian structures, it allows you to define many, many concepts, in particular, many concept, uh, concepts of curvature. Uh, 
there is uh, this full Riemann uh, curvature tensor. There is also sectional curvatures, scalar, and, and so on. But uh, there is also an approach uh, which deals with pure metric spaces, like, uh, for example, cut zero spaces, mm -hmm. which should be thought like something like uh, non positively curved. And this is outside uh, smooth, uh, smooth uh, context of, of smooth manifolds. So, uh, could you give some quick summary of what kinds of curvatures one can define in this in this more general context? Maybe analogs, well, something which is known in the case of Riemannian manifolds. The the main one is this sectional curvature, this analog of sectional curvature, whereby you say that in a metric space. You have curvature less than or equal to K. Oh, by the way, I had curvature in the title. There was no time. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> curvature less than or equal to K in a metric space. In a metric space. And when K is zero, you get cat zero. Um, if, well, now, the definition is a bit of a mouthful. Um, you do the following. First of all, you want to assume the metric space is a path metric space, meaning that if you define the intrinsic metric using curves, you get the same metric you started out with. So the, the, the distance between two points is the infimum of the lengths of curves connecting them. So you assume that. And then you consider geodesic triangles, meaning triangles consisting of geodesics for every geodesic triangle. Um, X, Y, Z. Um, and for every point in here, let's call it something else, P. The distance, so let's do L, let's do this, L1, L2, L3. You take your model space of curvature K, constant curvature K. So that's, if K is positive, you take a sphere of curvature K. If K is negative, you take a hyperbolic space, scaled appropriately so that the curvature is K. If K is zero, you take Euclidean space. So you have a model space of curvature K. You draw a, a geodesic triangle there with the same lengths. L2, L1, L2, L3, L4, and you demand that this triangle be at least as thin in a certain sense as that triangle. At least as thin, meaning that if you take a point on this geodesic and you measure the distances to these curves, that sum is at most as large as the corresponding sum over there. So there's a, a notion of thinness for triangles. You have a triangle with the appropriate lengths in the model space. You draw another one in the space you're interested in. And if the one in the space you're interested in is at most as thin as the one in the model space, you say the curvature is less than or equal to. And it's exactly if it's not less than or equal to anything less. Yeah. So, so there's a way to make sense of curvature that's purely metric in nature. I think this is due to Alexandrov. Uh, Gromov worked with it a lot, of course, as well, obviously, but I don't think the definition is due to him, or maybe some versions of the definition are due to him. This would be one way to make sense of curvature. So, uh, the smaller the curvature, the thinner are the triangles, yes? That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what you would expect, right? In mm -hmm. very negatively curved hyperbolic spaces, triangles look more and more like this. They look thinner and thinner. This is very negatively curved, yeah? 
Sorry, uh, I have one more uh, question related yeah. to this topic. In this context of, of this path metric spaces and this uh, curvature, is it possible to define the volume? Um, Such, uh, I don't know, space or? I don't know if in that generality it's possible. I don't know. I don't recall okay. seeing any such thing. It would be a little hard to make sense of because. So this definition of curvature is about triangles. Yes, since uh, this in the context of Riemannian uh, geometry, uh, there's also the, this notion of scalar curvature, and this is somehow related to the volumes of, of uh, geodesic uh, geodesic balls. Yes, it this. is, but I don't know about scalar curvature for metric spaces. Mm -hmm. There might be a notion, but I don't know it. Okay, okay, thank you. So yeah, this was more like sectional curvature, which is about planes. Okay. Some more. Okay, there is one more question. Just a comment, rather than a question, about this gromov hausdorff distance. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's used in pattern recognition, right? I mean, you look at some pattern as, as a metric space, you look at another pattern as a metric space, and you measure a distance. For instance, when you cross a border and you just mm -hmm. scan your passport, right? That, mm -hmm. That's what is used. Yeah. And uh, so that's one comment. And second one is that there is a very um, dynamically evolving uh, branch of non geometry about quantum gromov hausdorff distances. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's there's much work on that. Due to exactly. The yeah. year more recently, initially due to reefal, I think. Correct. Initially. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So certainly the non commutative geometers over there would have known this well. <laughs> Yeah. So, more questions, comments? Check on Zoom. Yes, let me see whether it's, there is something on Zoom. I don't see any raised hands. So, I think it's time to thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Somehow, time flies during these talks. It's, it's always. You think an hour is so long. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs>